Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Greg Hemmings on The Real Work Show. We just had a, a fascinating lightning round. Greg survived. I survived somehow. I, I feel a little wounded and scarred, but uh, I got through it, Mark. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, not, not everyone does. So, uh, And then, of course, as most of you will know, if you're familiar with the channel, uh, we have extended conversations. So if you found some of the answers interesting from the lightning round, we'll try and get more into those topics. Uh, Greg, welcome back. Thank you so much, Mark. Good to be back. So we're, we're, we're having fun. Uh, these interviews are interesting for me. Uh, I, I've mentioned before selfishly because um, I don't know, I know a lot of people that, that work in something like film. So it's interesting for me just, just for my own learning. Um, obviously, you, you, it's pretty hard to find someone that doesn't, that's not, uh, doesn't have the exposure to, to different films, obviously. Um, and it's super interesting to see what you're doing. So thank you. Yeah, well, I, th I think it's great. And what a cool format for you to learn. Um, is in a podcast format. You know, I'm, I'm a podcaster as well. And I learn in every episode, I'm, I'm learning so much about whatever the topic is of expertise of my guests. So you're, you're doing a great thing for yourself, Mark, and doing this very series for, for the people that are, that are also looking for the same knowledge. Awesome. 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 Thank you, Greg. Um, so one, one thing that uh, came up towards the tail end, you know, I, I threw a, a, a curveball at you which was this question about, about a film that you'd watched recently, maybe that impacted you. I know, I know that you're, um, you would consider yourself a storyteller. You're trying to tell, from what I understand of you, you're trying to tell stories that, that will impact people in terms of positive social change. I threw that question at you about a recent example. Um, and you mentioned a really interesting thing about, you know, sometimes we, we tend to, to watch things that maybe confirm our own biases. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that topic. Um, what, what kind of films you typically watch and how important do you think that is to hear different worldviews? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I've, oh, as a documentary filmmaker, now I have to uh, separate that from journalist. There's a lot of incredible filmmakers who are journalists and they approach uh, filmmaking in a slightly different way. Uh, I'm not a journalist. I did take some journalism in, in college, but, um, um, but to be a good documentary filmmaker, like a journalist, you should be what I call a fence stander, not a fence sitter, a fence stander. Yeah. And Mark, you and I both went to Boy Scouts together. And yeah. uh, when I was in Ventures, I remember coming up with this concept because we'd, we we had to vote on certain things. I would really want to hear what both sides of these arguing sides were talking about. I want to understand the whole picture. I've been like that since I was a kid. And I, and I always thought the word fence sitting is just really awful because it sounds like you're not making any decisions and you're kind of lazy. But if you stand up on a fence, you can see very well to the left and to the right, you know, even if you are leaning on the left or on the right, um, at least you can see on the opposite side. Yeah. So I've always approached storytelling that way. Um, uh, and with that, it gives you much more respect for, for both sides of a particular issue or a story, even though you might have your own intended bias, <laughs> you know? Um, so as a filmmaker, I try my best to act like a journalist in that regard. Journalists aren't allowed to, to tell manipulative bias stories, okay? Um, if uh, It's almost like becoming a, a physician. There's a, a set of standards to being a journalist that means you are, uh, to the best of your capacity, digging out truths and telling, uh, telling unbiased stories. That's why it's such a shame that in today's society, we do see in uh, uh, conservative and liberal media, um, I'm, I'm gonna pick on CNN and Fox right now, um, seeing them not telling the news, but they're creating entertainment out of what should be news, right? So um, big long answer for you here, but um, if we as storytellers can tell stories that move people in a certain direction that we want them to, but do it without throwing rocks and um, offending potentially half of your audience, yes. um, then that is the type of filmmaking I like to do. Yes. I'm still telling it from a, perspe a perspective and you know, straight up owning a bias, but yes. doing it in a way that's respectful to other points of views. Now, that's me as a filmmaker, but as a film consumer, I think this is where you, you stumped me, is when I watch films, I often am seeking the films that I want to see, okay. right? It's not like the, when you listen to the radio when, oh, a new, a new song just came up. Oh, that's interesting. You're t like it's such an investment to sit down and watch a film or a series, right? It's an investment of time. And if you're not into it in the first two or three minutes, you're done. You're just next. Right. 
So um, we tend to consume the media that we want uh, and the stories that we want to consume that fit with our own worldview and bubble and support our own perspective. And that's human nature. But is it important for us to recognize that, um, that it might not be telling the full story? I think that is important. 100%. No, it's, it's super interesting. I, I had a conversation with someone recently and um, we, we kind of uh, likened this to, to marriage disputes. You know, you're married, I'm married. Um, it, it's the kind of thing of if you're in a conflict, is it more important that you're right or that the truth comes out, right? Uh, it, those, those are not always the same thing, right? No, 100%. Uh, and so, so to your point, when you're telling stories, I like that, the, the idea of um, the, the truth is the most important thing, not our feelings or our experience being, being confirmed. Um, uh, it's not just about emotions and things like that. It's about exposing the reality of something and, and hopefully letting whoever's consuming it then come to their own, even if they're aware of your bias, uh, yep. giving them the permission to come to their, their own conclusions about it. No? And it's also interesting to, to respect the storyteller who by nature as a human is biased. So you think about David Suzuki, for example, if you watch a nature of things documentary, right. you may not agree at all with his um, mission or and his understanding of climate change. Um, however, you, you probably respect him yeah. as a scientist and as somebody who has actually done, done the research to find elements of truth. I'm using that as, as an example. Yeah. Um, and so as a viewer to turn off certain storytellers, um, you're missing out on a potential learning moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I personally uh, turn off, um, you know, um, American more right wing media. Like I'm not going to listen to too much of Steve Bannon's uh, perspectives, but what am I missing for not, you know? Um, but also if I were to delve into that content, I would feel like I, I need to be armed with some sort of um, knowledge first about the issue and not just l listen and believe things at face value. Um, yeah. And that goes for whichever perspective, left, right, up, or down. <laughs> you know? no, 100%. 100%. And, and, and I don't know if you'd agree with this, Greg. It's, it's been my own perception um, through some of the challenges from COVID and just more general, like you're talking about in terms of, of media and social media. Um, I find on a regular basis, uh, the reality is topics are just more com complicated than we make them out to be. Um, people are throwing pat answers in, in one direction or the other. Uh, to things that are actually a lot more complicated and a lot more nuanced than that. And then, and then kind of the worst part of it to me is, and then uh, you're an idiot or you're evil if you don't believe what I just said. That to me is that- nailed it. Part of it. This is what has been happening around the world. Now, in my, in my opinion, uh, it's been really magnified in the U.S. during this last uh, mm -hmm. election and sure. last four years, if you will, that there's been this polarization, and which goes to, oh, my gosh, this is such interesting thoughts, um, the power of leadership, right? I just, it's just a, it's a personality decision of the way Donald Trump might communicate something, right? Giving permission to a polarized discussion, if you will, right. um, where uh, a different leader might have a different approach, right? right? Um, but let's 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 turn those leaders into the, the tellers of stories, like filmmakers, for example, or authors, or whatnot. Um, the like pe there's power in, uh, in 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 these in these people's voices, you know. Yes. Whether you're a filmmaker, because you can put something out on the internet that that looks convincing and it's totally not true. You can totally do that. But but then someone's like, yeah, I think I saw that. I saw a film about that. Yeah, it must be true. Yes. You know. So I put this out here. This your your, your podcast, uh, the Real Work Show, is about work and work in the in the film industry. But this stuff is this stuff matters. Is about why you go to learn to get into this industry is because you want to affect change. But if you're going to do it in the way the abusive way that sure. leads people astray, then um, you are missing uh, out on a great opportunity to be respected worldwide as a credible source. Sure, story, sure. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and Greg, it makes me think about, you know, as a storyteller that can, that's telling stories, you're not like the, a grandfather, you know, telling a, a story to their grandchild. You're, you're telling a story on a much bigger scale. The influence, the potential influence, you know, for good or evil is much greater, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so do you see that as a, as a responsibility? Uh, to, to what extent are things like integrity important in terms of the way that you tell stories? 100% Mark. And uh, 
I love that you brought the word integrity. Like I uh, might've been the way I was brought up. Uh, maybe it was the, it was the neighborhood I was uh, living in with uh, down the street from you. Uh, whatever it was, I was, I was built with some sort of form of integrity that is still very, very important to me today. And um, I think if you approach storytelling with integrity, you're not going to go wrong. If you go wrong by mistake, there will be forgiveness for you. Sure. <laughs> you know, sure. Um, sure. But if you are choosing to manipulate as a storyteller, then um, you might get what you were hoping to get, right. and you might get paid very well to do that. Right. Um, but are you going to go to the grave happy <laughs> with what you've accomplished? Right. You might. Hey, listen, that, that, that might be all. Uh, that might be totally cool for the other person, but not for me. Right. As somebody who's guided by a different type of, uh, well, very basic, uh, you know, positive uh, morale, you know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it's very simple, a huge responsibility. We can, we can, we can manipulate a lot of things sure. uh, with the, within this medium, for sure. sure. Yeah, the, the, the kind of stories that you mentioned, even on your website, the kind of stories you're trying to, to, to tell, you know, you've emphasized positive social change. You're not just trying to drive social change. But but you've obviously given some thought to what what is what does positive social change look like, right? That's right. And what and, and what who does that mean? Oh, sorry. What does positive mean to who? Like yeah. I could say positive social change is you know, you know pulling people out of poverty in my in my city. Then in my mind, I'm like, who doesn't think that's a positive social change? Right. But there are stakeholders out there who um, pulling everybody out of poverty in this city would not be a positive. That would be a, a, a difficult challenge. Yeah. Um, but we pick stories uh, that matter to us. I say us as people in my company <laughs> and the stakeholder group in my company. And, uh, and um, we believe in a, in a fair, more just world. Uh, and we want to produce content that makes, contributes to a happier and kinder planet. And uh, as long as it fits within those parameters, uh, it's wide open, you know, and uh, Love it. it's good. Hey, hey, so, so um, you reminded me of a topic that came up. Uh, we did an interview recently with, uh, with a defense attorney. Uh, interesting discussion. And so, so one of the things I was interested in for him was kind of how important is his own belief about the client he's representing. Have you had situations where you felt some, some kind of tension? Um, you weren't totally sure you wanted to tell the story that a client was asking you to tell? Totally. Yeah, 100%. And uh on both sides of my business, um, one on the TV side. Uh, in that case, I was working for another company, but I was doing, uh, I was filming something that was, um, yeah, I think the only, like it was just, it didn't feel good at all. I was in a place, I wasn't in any danger, yep. but it was, um, I was filming something on the occult and uh, that's just not my groove. It's not my interest, but the, the, the negative energy I was feeling just by being there and helping promote the story did not feel good yeah. uh, for me. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a story for another time. It was, it was great. On the commercial side, hundred percent, we've, um, we've said no to certain clients for um, help, you know, a, a request to help them tell stories of something that's incredibly contentious. Right. Um, even though it might not, rub against uh, my own personal values or my own personal belief economically, politically, um, knowing that this piece of content will make my community more polarized. Yeah. Um, so I went ahead with one once and I regret it to this day. Um, and another one I said no to, and I got slapped by the client. Uh, they got mad at me for saying no. And they, they challenged, uh, they challenged me on, why we would do other work for them, but not this particular work. And uh, uh, so that was interesting. So yeah, hundred percent, you get challenged with this oftentimes when you are at service to other people's dollars, right? So films that we come up with in our own ideas and we go find money for, we're in control. Yeah. But if, if you, Mark, for example, came to Greg and say, hey, I've got $150,000, can you make this, this film? I would be, uh, you know, at your, um, you know that you're be, I would be beheld by your uh, your desires one way or the other because you're you're the client. Um, so on that side of the, of storytelling, it's uh, it's very important that you say no quickly, um, or if you say yes, just make sure you do it with integrity. Yeah, and 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 um, I think you've um, 
you didn't explicitly state it, but I guess part of that is you, you got to know what you believe. Otherwise, you have no criteria on which to base those those decisions, right? Very good point. And um, by the way, this is no judgment against people who haven't chosen to take a stance. Like some people just haven't allowed themselves to evolve to that point yet. Yeah. Um, cause it's not like this, it's not like go find a cause and go find a worldview. Like you got to kind of sure. move into it a little bit. And, um, I think that's, uh, that's important. But once you figure that out, then it's time, it's time to start, to start living to it, you know, yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, and again, it's credibility. If you say you are one thing, like if you go on our website at hemingsos.com, you're going to read a whole bunch of words that represent the values of our company. But then if you see us out doing something that, or producing something that's not in line, Sure. And where's our credibility gone? Right. right. Yeah. So it's it's really important as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a brand ambassador to to make sure that your public values and intentions are are lived to. One hundred percent. Especially these days, I think um, cus- customers, if they don't demand, I mean, they to an extent they demand that these days, right? If if you're not living your values, they're very likely these days to call you on it on social media. Oh yeah, totally. Very cool. One topic I wanted to talk a little bit about because um, um, obviously we may have younger people that are interested in film uh, watching these videos. That, that's for sure our intent. And um, I always try and get a little bit into the bridge between the edu- formal education and the actual work that you're doing. Um, all the work, this work that you've done in, in film, you mentioned a little bit about the formal education side, but, but overall, how, how helpful or, or not helpful has that been? In other words, how helpful has formal education been compared to, for example, your, your own study in terms of preparing you for the work that you're doing? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. Um, in high school, I, I only dabbled in video because um, I was in a band, as you know, Mark, and uh, I, I made a music video. Uh, we had VHS tapes and it was in media studies class and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was cool. VH what? What was that? VH what? You're, you're dating yourself. What's a VHS tape? Oh, VHS, yeah. <laughs> That's right. We used to make things on film and on VHS. Amazing. Oh, wow. And, uh, so the um, I ended up going to U- UMB SJ, um, which was our local university, uh, right out of high school. And I took arts because, well, I I'm, I play drums in a band and I like the arts. Maybe I should go into arts. Yeah. I didn't have much guidance, to be honest with you, and to where to go. You know. So I did that, and certainly no disrespect to UMB because it's an amazing university. But for me, in my brain, um, coming out of high school, going straight to there, a lot of my friends were still there. A lot of the content was just as dull and the same as it was in high school. And I just felt it was this, why am I doing this? Like, I'm doing this because someone said you're supposed to go to university next. That's why I went to. And uh, for a lot of people, that works really well. For me, I just, I was not engaged. And I, yeah, it, it, it didn't work. So I ended up finding myself going to a, a community college, a hands-on college, um, a trade college, if you will, and learned journalism, uh, radio journalism, uh, television, and film production in Niagara Falls at a place called Niagara College. And it was there that I learned the real technology of making films and making radio and making TV. And uh, so there, I it was wonderful education for me because it was hands-on. We made films. We didn't make very good films, but we made films. It was the, we're learning a process. And um, when I got out, I started working in the union uh, as a as a camera uh, in the camera department, and the union has a training track. So you you start at the bottom as a trainee, but you get paid pretty well. So I was working on like Disney sets and other feature films, and but you're just this, you're, you're the lowest guy on the ladder, and you get kicked around. And uh, but the training program itself is training by doing, which is awesome. So I got to build a little bit of a resume and a network that way. Um, and after about three years of that, I couldn't stand it anymore. Again my brain works a certain way. I couldn't stand um, being a creative person working in a creative business, but not being creative. Like in the camera department as a trainee, you're just schlepping gear and passing lenses. It's all the good work you're supposed to do. If you're, if you want to make a career as a camera person or as a sound person, but my brain is one that I need to be creative all the time and doing. And I did not like the militaristic approach to film sets. And it was just, for, it just wasn't for me. Um, so I quit and I found myself uh, on a sailboat in the Caribbean for a while. And uh, I thought I was never going to go back to the film industry ever again. Uh, but then when I, when I realized that exploring the Caribbean in South America was so interesting to me, and I actually had a video camera with me, 
and I captured a lot of it. I was like, I love this part. I love just exploring things and videotaping it. Right. And I came back and I, I, I was determined to make music documentaries. So I, I just started going to the music festivals I would go to anyway, but I slapped my camera with me and I started to make a name for myself. Um, so this is my self-learning part, right? And it was really funny because I, was, I would film music festivals in the summer and then I end up working on cruise ships in the Caribbean in the winter where they had all the big equipment, the editing equipment, because cruise ships have broadcast departments that I, I would run. So I didn't need to buy any gear for editing. I'd edit all my films in the winter on cruise ships on their equipment and then uh, come back and shoot more in the summer. Right. So I get to learn a lot about the digital side of um, by just by doing by working on cruise ships as an employee. Uh, and then I, I got to learn a lot about building a business by actually going out and actually finding clients that would pay me to go shoot their music festival or whatever content. And then that just started to snowball into doing TV shows and documentaries and, and much larger scale uh, commercial work uh, right. is where we are now. So the whole thing's been learning by doing. The formal education at the beginning, I enjoyed because it helped me learn to learn. Yes. It helped me learn a formal process. Yeah. which is great. And uh, I'm a big advocate for it if you're taking school for the right reason. If you just want to jump into the film industry and don't have the money for tuition, I would say go find your local IATSE union and say, how do I get into the training program? You can make a solid career in that track as a technician um, for the rest of your life. It's hard work. It's, you know, it's like 15 to 18 hour days. Sometimes you're on a shoot for five months and you're traveling and you don't see your family. All those things have to be considered, right. but you don't need school to get into the film industry. If, if you want to be a, uh, someone in the trades, you can learn through the union. And it's, I think it's a, it's one of the, uh, <laughs> one of the few right. thumbs up I have for unions is their, their training process is, is yeah. great. Yeah. You know, um, but of course, anyway, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's my experience, Mark. That, that work, of course, the, the track you just mentioned, not so creative, right? So, so but somebody that's interested in the industry likes the technical part of it, but those tracks are not so... You know. Well, they, they become creative. Like, I was in the camera department. I started as a third camera assistant, then a second camera assistant. And a camera assistant, back then we had film, so I was actually taking the film out of the camera mags, putting it back in, giving lenses, slating, you know, scene three, take two, all that stuff. But eventually, you're focus pulling. That's called the first camera assistant. Then you're actually operating the camera, which has a little bit of creativity to it. Right. But then you become the director of photography, which is uber creative. So okay. if you, and any of those gorgeous films you see in Hollywood, like you've got the director, but then you've got the director of photography. And the director of photography is the one that's taking the director's uh, vision and putting their own art to it. Like the aesthetic, the look right. comes from the director of photography. So it's two people making that film work in that aspect. So it, it does become creative, okay. but a lot of people don't get there and they don't want to. Like, it's just like not everybody who gets into politics wants to be the prime minister. Sure. You know, they'll find, a, they'll find a place, you know? Um, yeah, but for, again, for my brain, I'm an entre I've been an entrepreneur since I was a kid. I'm very unstructured. I've, I've found hyper-structure by surrounding myself with people who are structured in my company. Um, but um, I, I need the openness to be visionary enough to think about what the next project's going to be for that's, sure that's my space and greg in your, in your own journey like being someone that's super creative how challenging was it for you to acquire the the competencies on the on the business side you know obviously there's a pretty big chunk i would assume in terms of being a ceo that one wouldn't describe necessarily as creative right the, the actual you know the business side of it how difficult was it for you to acquire those kind of skills well the neat thing is i've been an entrepreneur since i was a kid um, I mowed lawns all through Milledgeville and uh, I literally mowed enough lawns to pay 100% of my four years of post-secondary education, no loans. Um, so I've been kind of working for myself since I was a kid. And uh, so in that part, I always understood money in, money out, all that right. stuff, paying right. taxes, all that. Um, but I didn't go to business school and film school. What it lacked was it didn't really, it didn't really go deep into budgets, into funding, uh, into legal to HR stuff that's regular business. That's if I could go back and do it again, I would really hope that they would have some serious business courses in mm -hmm. your film, your film schooling. But when I got out of film school and started my own business, I really 
I tried to surround myself by, you know, with a good bookkeeper, good lawyer, all that stuff. Um, but it wasn't until I grew to a point where I had some staff that could really unload some of those things from me that yeah. I realized that my job is to be a visionary. Right. And my team's job is to be the execution folks, you know. And uh, if you've got that luxury or that privilege, then I can keep thinking. I do a little bit of the production, a little bit but only if I want to and if I, or if I absolutely need to. Right. Um, for me, I'm all about coming up with ideas and, fi- and also finding money and stuff like that. So that's that, that part of being a CEO, it's still very cre- incredibly creative. Right. right. Um, and then I, I started, at, I was accepted into the Walsh McCain Institute for Entrepreneurship and Leadership about 11 or 12 years ago. And I learned a lot. And that's through University of New Brunswick. And um, I learned through my peers. We're in a cohort of 15 other entrepreneurs and I'm still with them. We, we meet every quarter. Um, it's kind of like YPO uh, or, you know, any of those other forums. And uh, just to be able to talk ideas out and struggles and learn from other people's experiences was my continued journey into being a CEO. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, so Greg, one, one important question I wanted to kind of uh, leave people with was um, your, your advice specifically for, um, I think the film industry is one um, not unlike a number of others that that's that's intimidating uh, for somebody that's that's got interest in it, not really sure where to start. Maybe they don't have the context and they're looking for a way to break in. Um, you know, short of doing some schooling, any other advice in terms of how does somebody start rubbing shoulders with people that are doing it or, or getting it, get involved in the film industry? Yeah, well, um, most jurisdictions across this country have a film co-op, and we have one called the New Brunswick Filmmakers Co-op here in New Brunswick. And uh, it's an amazing training uh, place for young, young emerging filmmakers because you get to hold the equipment. You get to like, you could, you could quickly climb the ladder on a film co-op shoot and become a director of photography quickly, maybe over, over a period of a year where it might take you 20 years in the, in the professional world. But if you can get some good credits on short films, uh, independent films, that helps you build your credibility, your skill set, And when you come to a company like mine with a right. resume, I want to see what you've done. I'm like, oh yeah, well here's here's three of my films on Vimeo. Check, check them out. I was the DP, or I edited this, or I did the sound design. I'm like, okay, cool. You got some chops. Awesome. That that matters to me way more than your resume, but what school you went to and all that stuff. I want to see the work. And then if you don't have the work, a number of people have come through my company as high school co-op students or interns or just straight up volunteers saying, Greg, I don't know anything about your business, but I'll lug gear, whatever. I'm like, yeah, no problem. Come on up. And then they learn. And if they like it, they come back again and again. And then eventually we're like, oh yeah, we can trust them. Why don't we pay them on the next one? (laughs) Usually it doesn't take uh, more than two or three volunteer gigs before people like us are like, okay, they're committed. They know what they're doing. We trust them. Right. Our budget, let's hire them for the project. Right. Volunteer, do, do not expect money at the beginning. Just get your get your butt onto a set and figure it out. <laughs> and right. yeah, and that's it. Fantastic, Greg. This has been uh, super interesting. Um, we have fifty other questions we'd like to ask you, but we have to have a reason to bring you back. So that that was very, very helpful. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. This has been awesome. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and for all of you that are, are watching this video. Um, again, we're doing these videos specifically for people that are, are maybe struggling or haven't quite connected with work they love. You've had the opportunity here to, to, uh, to hear from Greg, uh, who's found this work in film that he loves and even built a, a successful business out of it, uh, driving positive social change. Hopefully it's been helpful for you. Uh, be sure to subscribe and check out other videos and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks so much, Greg. See you, Mark.